All right, well, let's get rolling. So I'm uh, Craig Kubitschek. Uh, you may or may not know me. Uh, since the last time I've had the opportunity to um, preach, uh, there's a whole lot of new faces here in this room and a whole lot of new faces uh, online. But I'm one of our uh, lay pastors. I, I get questions uh, every so often like, okay, what does that actually mean, Craig? What it means is I work in the business world. I get paid in the business world, but I have the absolute privilege and pleasure and just a humble ability to get to shepherd, lead, and come alongside the rest of our pastoral team. Um, there's three of us that are lay elders, Jeff Brzezinski and uh, Justin Nichols, and uh, it's just an absolute honor to get to, to be with you guys tonight. Um, every once in a while, I, I don't know if this happens to you or not, but for me, uh, I come across a word that is a bit unique. Maybe, maybe it's a word that I don't use very often. It's, it's not something I use on the reg, and it's just, you know, unique. It's odd to me, and what happens, though, is I begin to think about this word, and I start to see this word, like, everywhere. It's like when you buy a car, you've never seen that car on the road, and then all of a sudden you buy it, and every car you see happens to be that car, right? Well, this word, wonderful, or wonder, I should say more specifically, has really captivated my thought process. It's really made me start to wrestle and think about what are the things in my life that I've experienced that cause me to wonder. So I want to bring you into a couple of those. The first is a ski mountain. I'm an avid um, skier, not like the people who go here to little weird bunny hill thing that you guys call a hill. Uh, I lived in Colorado for five years. Uh, I used to get about 20 days out on the snow, and I am an avid skier. I, I, I don't like the front side of the mountain. For those that do, I'm, that's great. You can stay on the bunnies and the greens and the blues. That's fine. I want to get back like three bowls. And this is a picture in Utah where uh, we were skiing. It's actually Robert Redford's little resort thing. And I'm like two bowls back. And when you stand on the edge, there's about a two-foot cliff here. There's not another soul, because probably no one's stupid enough to be back there with me. And it's quiet. And you're about to drop in. And for you hip people, send it. You just stand there and wonder. And you look at that and go, God does some awesome stuff. Or another place that causes me to wonder is in Canada. Every year for the last 15 years or so, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, and uh, my grandfather-in-law, who passed away a couple years ago, we would go to Canada. And this is in the, literally the middle of absolute nowhere Canada. And when we would get out in the mornings or the day, we're, we're the, we basically fish for like 10 hours a day. My wife doesn't believe me, but it's hard work. And there's usually loons out there making their weird loon call, and there's beavers smacking the water with their tails, and there's ospreys and bald eagles flying over. And our first boat ride out, all three of us just sit in the boat and go, whoa. I mean, it causes this wonder, this awe-inspiring. You'll get a theme here. Or go to Yosemite. I like mountains. I'm not much of a beach person. It's salty. It's sandy. This isn't Ansel Adams. I actually took this picture. Very proud of myself. In the back, you've got Half Dome. On the left, you have El Cap. On the right, you've got the waterfall. When you stand in there, I, again, I lived in Colorado, like next to the mountains. There is something very different about Yosemite. When you're standing next to a sheer cliff, you, there is nothing you can do but sit there and wonder and go, whoa. Let me make it a little bit more personal. I've got four kids. I've got a about-to-be-seven-year-old who thinks she's 18. I've got twins who just turned four, and I've got a pandemic baby who's about two years old. She's going to love that we call her that. And here's a picture of me getting to hold my twins who were like, I always get it wrong. They were like three weeks earlier. They were tiny, like tiny. There is something about the fact that I got to stand and sit and watch my wife give birth from beginning to end. That is absolutely a wonder. First of all, I'm very queasy. Story for a different time. Asked my wife, passed out during ultrasound. We found out we had twins. I'm not afraid to admit it. I did, okay? <laughs> but this, I was rock solid. And when I, when I held these two after they got done screaming and everything, like, you just stand in wonder. 
What causes you to wonder like that? My hope and my prayer for us tonight is that word wonder would radically change the way that we think, approach, and look at God's scriptures. If you guys have got your Bibles, turn to Psalm 119. We're going to jump back in and specifically into verse 129. Here's what 129 says. The psalmist declares and makes a proclamation. We're going to see three things happen where there's going to be an initial proclamation. The psalmist is going to declare things back to God, and there's going to be some action that transpires. So the first thing that he proclaims, he says, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. We're going to ask a lot of questions tonight. I like questions. So here's the first question that we all have to ask ourselves, and it's going to drive our entire time. Do you actually believe his testimonies are wonderful? Are the words of God, his precepts, his truth, his voice, are they wonderful to you? Let me, let me put it this way. Do they create such wonder? Are they wonder producing like standing at the edge of a cliff? You stand in awe when you open them up. Or as I think most of our, us live our lives, we look at God's word not as wonderful, but we begin to look at it like it's a historic book. For some of us, as we approach God's testimonies, they feel burdensome, although scripture says the contrary. As we look at our lives, for some of us, we look at his word, not as a wonderful book, but we look at them as suggestions. We like this group of scripture, we like this group of scripture, but eh, these ones, I think they're just suggestions. For some of you might look at them as just joy kills. There's just a bunch of book of rules For others of you, there was a time when God's word was very wonderful. So much so that you had kind of these mantras, so much so that you've tattooed scripture on your arm, but now all they are is some words on your arm in ink, and they're just this nice mantra. They're not wonder producing anymore. And so I've got to ask you, are they wonderful? Because guess what? If God's word is not wonderful, what the psalmist says here is you will not keep them. It's a very powerful word in this first sentence. It says, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore I keep them. I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, he's using this language of, all right, they're wonderful, so I'm going to keep them. I mean, here's what's crazy. You might not remember this, but back in Psalm 119.18, many, many moons ago, (laughs) The psalmist asked God to show him the wondrousness of his word. Check this out. Psalm 119, 18. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Early on, he asked God, show me, make your word wonder producing. And now he's declaring, oh yeah, it is wonderful. And I'm going to keep your word. Let me put it like this. I I mentioned I got four kids. We live on this awesome like street, awesome sidewalks. And we go on walks like all the time, even when it's like negative four, like tonight. My kids know that if I give them rules and they think they're wonderful, guess what? They keep them. However, if they don't think they're wonderful, guess what? They don't keep them, right? And so when we go on a walk, we have this really long stretch that's even out of my wife and I's eyesight that they know that they can go to this stop sign and they can stop. And then when we catch up, they can then go to this cul-de-sac, go around the cul-de-sac and then stop and so forth and so on. And so when we have friends or when my parents come over and the first time they were on a walk with us, they're like, whoa, 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 we can't see the kids. Where are they? They're good. What my kids know is that what mommy and daddy say, when they believe that they're wonderful, they experience freedom. They get to go a long ways away. They get to go around the cul-de-sac. They get to do that. But every once in a while, again, four-year-olds, right? They want to test. 
ah, or what mommy and dad say, really wonderful. So they don't like go across the street. They just like get on the edge, cross the line that we've told them. And we very quickly say, no. And they have consequences. That consequences is they're restricted. And what they then begin to very quickly find out when we see mommy and daddy's rules as wonderful, freedom, keep them. When we don't, when we question, we miss out. I think that's what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying, look, I know that your word is so stinking wonderful, I have to keep them. Let me make this super clear. You and I will not keep God's commandments by going to church every week, by praying every day, by reading scripture, memorizing scripture, by showing up early to meet with God and send by God, to showing up to your lot family on time, which you should do. You will not, will not keep his commandments. If that's your strategy, hear this, my friends. That is what the Pharisees did. They were really, really, really good by keeping all of the, what they thought were rules and they never saw God's word as wonderful. Your struggle, my struggle, our fight to keep his words comes down 100% to whether or not you believe, you live out that his word is wonder producing. And so I ask the question again, is God's word wonderful to you? Let me put it a different way. How is it wonder producing in your life? Do your friends see it? Do your professor see it? Does your boss see it? Does your wife see it? Does your girlfriend see it? How is God's word wonder producing in your life? Your New Year's resolution to read through the Bible next year will get you through maybe the end of January, maybe some of you to July, and there ain't no way it's going to get you to December 29th. And those that did, kudos to you. You're better than everybody else in the room, okay? But what will change your life, what will make you want to be in his word is when they're wonderful. So, the psalmist continues on in this proclamation in verse 130. He says, the unfolding of your words, i.e. the wonder producing of your words, gives light and imparts understanding to the simple. What the psalmist is saying is, look, when God's word is wonderful, I begin to see the benefits. We've been talking a lot the last couple of weeks about the light that moves the darkness away. The psalmist is saying, look, when your word is wonderful, I see it. And I understand that your word makes things simple for me to understand. Just go look through all of the Psalms and all of the Proverbs and look how many times light is talked about and understanding is given because of how wonderful God's word is. And then he ends his proclamation with this very interesting sentence. I open my mouth and pant. It's a really weird word. Because I long for your commandments. I think the problem with words like pant, when we come to them in scripture, we go, huh, that's a cool word. I've heard something about deers panting for a river. Yeah, let's move on. We have no concept of what it means to pant. Like, that's really weird. Like, if you showed up at your friend's house and they're like, <gasps> like, that's just weird, right? So let me, let me phrase it a little bit differently. Have any of you ever been thirsty? I, I mean, like, really, 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 really thirsty. Or maybe put it a different way, hungry. Here's the reality. The answer is no. I could be wrong. But the reality is, is we come to words like pant and we have no concept of thirst because we live here in America. We have a whole tank full of water. If you're thirsty, here you go. So here's the reality. We don't get it. Again, four kids. I get to like have my dad humor. I think it's dad humor. My kids absolutely hate it. My kids will come almost every single day, multiple times a day. Daddy, I'm thirsty. And then I get to use my dad's sarcasm and go, hi, thirsty, I'm daddy. 
And I do it at so much, this, at this point, they're like, oh, dad. And they're like, I'm thirsty. I'm like, you're not thirsty. And in my very cynical way, I'm trying the best I can to help them understand that, look, there are kids on the other side of the world who actually are thirsty. You're not one of them. You got a faucet. You're good. Okay. But we, we, we have no concept of thirst. The best I can think about what thirst is, is back in the day when I used to do youth ministry, we used to do the cracker challenge. Anybody done the cracker challenge? Take seven saltine crackers, eat them in a minute. Good luck. Try it tonight. I highly don't recommend it. Okay. You get to like cracker three, you're like, oh, I got this. You get to cracker four, all the saliva in your mouth, gone. You get to cracker five, you're like, oh my goodness, I might suffocate to death. Please, somebody give me water now. I can't do it. And then everybody's like, no, you can do it. Keep shoving more. And then you start spewing cracker everywhere, right? It's the closest I can get to what thirst is, okay? So take that imagery, whatever you want to do with it, and look at this definition of what pant actually means. There's two definitions. I find them very interesting. First, breathe quickly if you're, you know, about to die from the cracker challenge. Typically from excitement, hunger or thirst. But here's the one that I think is more interesting. To crave or desire urgently. I think what the psalmist is saying here is, look, I understand that your word is so wonderful that I want to crave it. I, I want to desire it. It's actually a synonym for longing, which is why he connects, I long for your commandments. He's like, man, I crave your word. Over the last year, uh, I've been going through um, some counseling just to, to deal with a whole lot of stuff. And it was really interesting. It was kind of crazy. The day I was studying this for tonight, out of nowhere, my counselor used the word longing and pant in weird, completely different contexts. And I won't bore you to death with that. But the thing that was really interesting, we, we began to talk about this idea of pant and long. And for you and me, when we come to these words, we think that they are fleeting mo emotions. I pant, I move on. I pant, I move on. Actually, the word pant and longing means something completely different. They mean time-consuming, engagement, pressing in with curiosity to learn more. What the psalmist is saying is your words are wonderful, and so I pant, I long, I crave to press in with curiosity, to learn, understand, to be in awe and wonder of what you're doing. So the question then has to be asked, what do you long for tonight? Like when you walked in here, in the depths of your soul, what are you longing for? Like some of you tonight, you're like, man, I have. Like I've been longing for God's word. Like God is doing some incredible things and praise God, that is absolutely amazing. But for some of you, you walked in here longing deeply for relational connection deeply, deeply. For some of you, you've been desiring to have children and you are longing for it. It takes every consuming thought that you have and I get it. For others of you, you walk in here longing for some semblance of comfort. It's been a hard year. There's a lot of pain and suffering and sorrow. And so you're longing for comfort and you look for it in everything from food to drugs to sex to rock and roll. You're longing for it deeply. As I began to wrestle with this question in my own life, this is going to sound really funny. At least it does for me. Um, I've been longing working out. I know that sounds crazy. Maybe to you, maybe not. Um, a couple months ago, actually, it's been longer than that. It's been a while now. My wife started to do personal training, get worked out, whatever. She gets fit. I can't um, let her like, you know, get in shape and not me. So I only do things one way, either all in or all out. So I said, sweet, I'm building a gym in our basement and I'm going full bore. Got rack, dumbbells, slam balls, you name it. I got it. We're going to town. Okay. I got the gear. It's, it's game on. And I find myself never would have thought longing when I get home from work and put our kids to bed to long to work out from eight o'clock to nine o'clock at night. Again, I have four kids. It's the only time I can do it, okay? But I find myself throughout the day longing to work out. I know it doesn't show. I promise you I am, okay? <laughs> what are you longing for? 
In the depths of your soul, what is it? And then the psalmist moves from this proclamation about how awesome God's word is to this incredible declaration back to God. Check this out in verse 132. He says, turn to me and be gracious to me as is your way with those who love your name. What the psalmist is doing is he's declaring his identity back to God. Because God's word has been so wonderful, he's been so consumed and wrapped up and craving it, he's seen all of the promises, he's seen all of the goodness, and so in his prayers, he's declaring this back to God. Do your prayers consistently look like this, where you declare the truths of who God is and who you are in him back to him, or are your prayers more filled with your wants and your needs and your complaints? Let me be clear. God wants to know your wants and your needs and complaints. But do you declare, because you've been sitting in his word and it's so wonderful, the truths back to him? I mean, what I appreciate about the psalmist is his candor. I mean, he literally approaches the throne with such candor. We just sang about it earlier. Brad talked about it. Like, do you approach God this way? Here's the deal. If God's word is wonderful, you will declare his promises and his truths back to him. It'll change your prayer life completely. And then we get to the crux of this whole text within Psalm 119 in this section. Verse 133 he says this, keep steady my steps according to your promises and let no iniquity get dominion over me. I think what the psalmist knows is that in this broken world of sin, in the broken humanity of himself, it is natural to want to stray, to stumble, to fall. He knows the pressures of the world that are going on around him because it's broken. And so he is declaring back to God, please make my steps secure. And then he goes on and he says, do not let iniquity have dominion over me. Two words that I find very fascinating, iniquity and dominion. The word iniquity is used 156 times throughout scripture and only two times in the New Testament. And here's the definition of it. It says, uh, the definition of iniquity is a wicked act or thing. What What it's saying is, God, don't let any wicked act or something rise to the level of what ultimately equals sin. And then he says, don't let it have dominion. Dominion is used 37 times throughout all of scriptures and only two times here and in Romans is it connected to sin. Every other time the word dominion is mentioned, it's talking about a king's dominion over all of his subjects, whether a good king, whether a bad king, or whether the King Jesus. It's talking about this idea of dominion. We don't understand the word dominion. We live in this nice little democracy area where we don't have some quote unquote authority that dictates everything. But back in the Bible times and medieval times, there would be a king and that king's rules would have to be obeyed, whether you were the servant or whether you were nobility, or even if you were the prince. They had dominion over their land and whatever they said went and you had to obey or there were consequences. What the psalmist understands is that if left unchecked, sin, iniquity could have dominion reign over him so much so that he has to obey it and he's saying, please, Lord, no. Paul gets the same truth. I'd encourage you to turn over to Romans 6. In Romans 6, it's right in the passage where he's talking about being dead to sin and alive to God. And Paul declares the exact same truth, understanding that sin, if not dealt with, could reign over your world. He says this in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign, i.e. have dominion, in your mortal bodies, 
to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments as for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. What the psalmist and what Paul understand is that if left alone, sin can have dominion over you. And so I got to ask another question then. Tonight, what has or possibly could have dominion over you? Now, as I began to wrestle with that question, and if you're anything like me, all of your defenses start to come up. Whoa, whoa. Nothing has dominion over me. I love Jesus. I might sin here and there, but I, like nothing's got dominion over me. Maybe so. But maybe a good starting point to begin to unpack that question is going back to the question when I said, what are you longing for? See, the thing about iniquity is we can take wicked things or we can take things and make them ultimate things which make them sin. And so maybe your longing right now isn't having dominion over you or maybe it is. So maybe you begin to wrestle with that thought process. What, do I, what am I longing for and has it begin to have dominion over me? As I began to wrestle with this question, I began to start to go, okay, well, I have this longing to work out, totally a good thing, good for my mental health, my physical health, all that good stuff. But what I began to realize and what God began to convict my heart that possibly can and at times has had dominion over me is anger. My whole life, I've struggled with anger. And at times it has had dominion over me. And I've been processing through that in this last year of counseling. One of the things that I've come to realize is that anger is incredibly productive. Like it, it causes you to do things. It's for me, very comforting. My wife and I joke sometimes that she just gets me mad just so I'll go clean the house because that's like my natural motive operation. And sometimes I think she might really do it and she's just listening online. So I'll get beat up later, but it's okay. But what I began to realize is, again, four kids. Sometimes I'm not going and longing to work out to work out. I'm going to escape. Instead of processing the anger that's raging inside of my soul, it's really easy to go turn some techno music. Yes, guilty pleasure. I listen to techno music when I'm, when I'm working out. And to start throwing a slam ball on the ground and start throwing some weights up and not actually deal with what's brewing underneath. On the flip side, dealing with the grief that I might be struggling with, because that doesn't feel comfortable and that doesn't feel safe and that sure isn't productive, I think. So for you, what has or could have dominion over you? Maybe for you, it's your job, it's your career. You wake up every morning, you go to work, you work 18 hours a day, you've justified that it's okay to work 18 hours a day because you're providing for your family, you're getting ahead, you're trying to save up money for this, that, and the other, but it has complete dominion over you. It rules every train of thought process. It rules every single thing in your life, and you've justified it. You've questioned it away, but it has dominion over you. Maybe for some of you, parenting has had dominion over you. It was a great thing. It started out as an okay thing. It was a longing, but now it rules and reigns and controls every fabric of your being. And now it's sin. It's your idol. For some of you, it might be approval. Every ounce of your being is seeking approval from everybody else but the king of kings who's already given it to you. Or maybe for some of you, it's performance. I can be a performance junkie. I've just got to perform. And it can rule and it can reign and you are just sitting under the weight of it. My wife and I just, uh, the last couple of weeks, starting in December, went through the whole COVID thing. And it was really interesting. We began to talk about how the mental game came to play. Like for two years, right, we've been fed all kinds of information, good, bad, and ugly, right? And it was interesting how much the thoughts the mental played into it. Maybe it's not COVID for you, but it's anxiety. It's depression. It has dominion and rule in your life, and it's controlling you. Or maybe for others, it's 
the kingdom of thyself. You rule, you reign, you make the rules no one can speak in. Guess what, my friends? It's not meant to be that way. For those who believe in the name of Jesus as their king and as their Lord, check out what verse 14 says in Romans 6. For sin will have what? Say what? Not some, not a little, not partial. It will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but you are under grace. My friends, for those who have professed the name of Jesus, sin cannot ultimately have dominion over you. You can give pleasure to it. You can give eye to it, but it cannot rule and reign in your life. It's why Paul said this, In 2 Timothy 2.19 to Timothy, but God's firm foundation, need a steady path, stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. I don't know if anything else will get you excited, but if you profess the name of Jesus, the Lord knows you're his. You're his child. And let Everyone who names the name of the Lord, depart, flee, run away from what? Iniquity. For those who are in Christ, the dominion cannot have its roots deeply in you. It might for fleeting moments, but that is why the psalmist says, Lord, in Psalm 134, redeem me from my man's oppression. That was his dominion. That I might keep your precepts. And then in the last declaration, check out what he says. Make your face shine upon who? Interesting word choice, your servant. Because I think what the psalmist knows is that for sin to not have dominion over him, the God of the universe, the King of kings and the Lord of lords must have dominion and he is his servant And so he is going to ask, God, teach me your statutes. Let me connect all of this with a pretty interesting text in Jude. Jude 1, 24, (laughs) I think summarizes all this in a beautiful way. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, interesting word choice, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. There ain't nothing you can do to be presented blameless other than this. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. If you're like me, this is the point in a sermon where you're like, I would really like some practical application, please. Like you keep talking, Craig, about God's word being wonderful, but like, how do I, how do I do that? Because when I look at it, it's really boring and it's, it's it's not fun. And like, how, like how? I I know this is going to sound like a very, very simple truth. And we talk about it week in and week out because it's the only thing that matters. For you to ever see that God's word is wonderful, you have to first declare that Jesus has dominion over your life. If he has no dominion over your life, you will never see his word as wonderful. But if he has dominion, then you will long for his word. You will crave to see why it is so stinking wonderful. It's incredible when that happens. And what the psalmist is saying, when I do that, when you shine your face upon me, my whole being is driven to action. And so we're going to get insanely practical in verse 136. This is the action that is driven out of a heart that sees that God's word is wonderful. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. You want a practical application? 
When was the last time you wept, cried, shed streams of tears for those who don't know God's word is wonderful? Or do you just get angry and mad and frustrated that they keep doing bad things? This verse for me has been kicking me in the teeth. I don't know a lot of you, but here's a little insight into me. I'm not super emotional. I don't cry often. Mark and I, we joke, we're very different, and he is a way better for it. And so I came to this verse, and I started to wrestle, when was the last time in my prayer life that I just weep? for those who are under the dominion of sin and don't see his word wonderful. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to talk to a, a friend of mine. He was looking potentially to move to a different job. He wanted to move to a more Christian job. No such thing. Totally different sermon for a different time. But we began to talk through it, and the environment that he's in today is not very Christian-like at all. And he was struggling specifically that the more he was successful, he was struggling the fact that then he made the ownership, the CEO and others, more money, made them more successful. And so he, he didn't feel valued, cared for, fill in the blank. And so he was struggling. I need to go to a more Christian environment so I can be more around Christian people. And it was one of those moments where God just kind of laid everything in front of me. And I just said, well, what about Joseph? Joseph and David, and Daniel, and Shadrach, and Meshach, and to bed we go. I always just say that. They served pagan kings, and they realized that they needed to work for the Lord and not for man, and they were wildly successful, made those kings wildly successful, and guess what? Some of them came to know the Lord. And so I just asked my friend, when was the last time on your drive to work did you pray for your boss? And the answer, because he was honest and I appreciated it, was never. And so I said, well, maybe before you go start looking for a new Christian job, maybe you should start praying, because maybe God has you right here to be like Joseph, to be in the bellows, to work your tail off. Because one of the downfalls of Christianity is we don't want to work hard for whatever reason, but when in the business world, me being in the business world, one of the greatest witnesses you can have is work your tail off for people who don't know Jesus and tell them why you're working really hard, that you're doing it not for them and not for themselves, but you're doing it for the Lord. So that they can then begin to experience why God's word is wonderful in your life. So get this. If God's word is wonderful to you, if it is wonder producing, you will not only keep it, you will long for it and it will have such dominion over your life that you will weep for those who do not see it as wonderful. But my friends, if God's word is not wonderful, then other things will be wonderful you will long for other things, and if not kept in check, they will have dominion over you, and you will not weep for the world, let alone for yourself, because it will have such dominion and such darkness that you see no way out. But my friends, there is a better truth and a better way. So will you stand with me as I read this last text over you? In Philippians chapter three, verse 17, Paul declares this. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But check out this amazing, beautiful, wonderful truth. But our citizenship is in heaven. For those who profess the name of Christ, our citizenship is in heaven. And he says, and from it we await a savior 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Either God has dominion over your life or he doesn't. But if he does, my friends, you will read the scripture like this and you will go, oh my goodness, that is wonderful. And it will be like standing at the edge of the cliff and you'll crave it and you'll desire it and you'll long for it. So let me pray for us. God, may your word be wonder producing because you are a God who is glorious and wonderful and you have dominion.